Episode 2 George III was still living, an aged lunatic, at Windsor, completely impervious to the impressions of the outer world. Of his seven sons, the youngest was of more than middle age, and none had legitimate offspring. The outlook, therefore, was ambiguous. It seemed highly improbable that the Prince Regent, who had lately been obliged to abandon his stays and presented a preposterous figure of debauched obesity, could ever again, even on the supposition that he divorced his wife and remarried, become the father of a family. Besides the Duke of Kent, who must be noticed separately, the other brothers, in order of seniority, were the Dukes of York, Clarence, Cumberland, Sussex, and Cambridge. Their situations and prospects require a brief description. The Duke of York, whose escapades in times past with Mrs. Clark and the army had brought him into trouble, now divided his life between London and a large, extravagantly ordered and extremely uncomfortable country house where he occupied himself with racing, whist, and improper stories. He was remarkable among the princes for one reason. He was the only one of them, so we are informed by a highly competent observer who had the feelings of a gentleman. He had been long married to the Princess Royal of Prussia, a lady who rarely went to bed and was perpetually surrounded by vast numbers of dogs, parrots, and monkeys. They had no children. The Duke of Clarence had lived for many years in complete obscurity with Mrs. Jordan, the actress, in Bushy Park. By her he had had a large family of sons and daughters, and had appeared, in effect to be married to her, when he suddenly separated from her and offered to marry Miss Wycombe a crazy woman of large fortune, who, however, would have nothing to say to him. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Jordan died in distressed circumstances in Paris. The Duke of Cumberland was probably the most unpopular man in England. Hideously ugly, with a distorted eye, he was bad-tempered and vindictive in private, a violent reactionary in politics and was subsequently suspected of murdering his valet and of having carried on an amorous intrigue of an extremely scandalous kind. He had lately married a German princess, but there were as yet no children by the marriage. The Duke of Sussex had mildly literary tastes and collected books. He had married Lady Augusta Murray, by whom he had two children, but the marriage, under the Royal Marriages Act, was declared void. On Lady Augusta's death, he married Lady Cecilia Buggin. She changed her name to Underwood, but this marriage also was void. Of the Duke of Cambridge, the youngest of the brothers, not very much was known. He lived in Hanover, wore a blonde wig, chattered and fidgeted a great deal, and was unmarried. Besides his seven sons, George III had five surviving daughters. Of these, two, the Queen of Wurttemberg and the Duchess of Gloucester, were married and childless. The three unmarried princesses, Augusta, Elizabeth, and Sophia, were all over forty. The fourth son of George III was Edward, Duke of Kent. He was now fifty years of age, a tall, stout, vigorous man, highly colored, with bushy eyebrows, a bald top to his head, and what hair he had carefully dyed a glossy black. His dress was extremely neat, and in his whole appearance there was a rigidity which did not belie his character. He had spent his early life in the army, at Gibraltar, in Canada, in the West Indies, and, under the influence of military training, had become at first a disciplinarian and at last a martinet. In 1802, having been sent to Gibraltar to restore order in a mutinous garrison, he was recalled for undue severity, and his active career had come to an end. Since then he had spent his life regulating his domestic arrangements with great exactitude, busying himself with the affairs of his numerous dependents, designing clocks, and struggling to restore order to his finances, for, in spite of his being, as someone said who knew him well regal comme de papier musique, and in spite of an income of 2,000-4,000 a year, he was hopelessly in debt. He had quarreled with most of his brothers, particularly with the prince regent, and it was only natural that he should have joined the political opposition and become a pillar of the Whigs. What his political opinions may actually have been is open to doubt. It has often been asserted that he was a liberal, or even a radical, 
and, if we are to believe Robert Owen, he was a necessitarian socialist. His relations with Owen, the shrewd, gullible, high-minded, wrong-headed, illustrious and preposterous father of socialism and cooperation, were curious and characteristic. He talked of visiting the mills at New Lanark. He did, in fact, preside at one of Owen's public meetings. He corresponded with him on confidential terms, and he even, so Owen assures us, returned after his death. From the sphere of spirits to give encouragement to the Owenites on earth. In an especial manner, says Owen, I have to name the very anxious feelings of the spirit of His Royal Highness, the late Duke of Kent who early informed me that there were no titles in the spiritual spheres into which he had entered, to benefit, not a class, a sect, a party, or any particular country, but the whole of the human race, through futurity. His whole spirit proceeding with me has been most beautiful, Owen adds, making his own appointments, and never in one instance has this spirit not been punctual to the minute he had named. But Owen was of a sanguine temperament. He also numbered among his proselytes President Jefferson, Prince Metternich, and Napoleon, so that some uncertainty must still linger over the Duke of Kent's views. But there is no uncertainty about another circumstance. His Royal Highness borrowed from Robert Owen, on various occasions, various sums of money which were never repaid and amounted in all to several hundred pounds.